Dr. Shaji Chaka will come forward and introduce the speaker this morning. Would you put your hands together and please welcome our own Dr. Shaji Chaka. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from all. The Lord delivers from them all. That is the promise as a community of believers that we are going to claim this morning. And God is going to use again, once again, IPC Hebron family's privilege to have Dr. Nabil Qureshi this morning. And also in, the, in our midst, Michelle, uh, his beloved wife, Michelle is here. And also his cute little one, baby Aya is also here with us in our nursery. We are so delighted. We are so thankful to the Lord uh, for the life that God has invested in you for Christendom. Uh, we are so thankful. In the midst of this uh, refining time of his life, God is blessing Christians all over the world through Nabil's life. We are so much thankful. Uh, Victor Frankel, uh, who was uh, a Holocaust survivor uh, living in concentration camp, this is what he said. A small and inadequate faith is like a small fire. It can be blown out by a small breeze. True faith, by contrast, is like a strong fire. When it is hit by a strong wind, it is fanned into an inextinguishable flame. That's what Nabil's life is all about. There's nothing more needed to be said. As a community of believers, we strongly believe that the Lord is going to use this ordeal to bring out end-time ministry to this man of God. We truly believe that as a community, community of believers. He's an outstanding apologist, always defending gospel, gospel of Christ, defending Christ in very hostile setting that not, a, not everybody is able to do at, or uh, called to do that. His effectiveness, bringing, bringing the truth and leading the transformation of many. He's an outstanding author, New York Times bestseller author. You just heard from Pastor Sam. God is using his books, seeking Allah, finding Jesus, not God but one, Allah or Jesus answering jihad let us pray that those books through his work it will uh, it will get into the places where gospel cannot reach it will like reach unlikely hands for the glory of god with no further delay could we put our hands together and let the dr nabil and michelle know that how much us a community of believers how much we appreciate how much we are thankful to the lord dr nabil Qureshi. Please be seated. Sometimes the worship is so good, I wonder what I'm doing. Why am I even preaching? Let's just keep worshiping. In fact, the, the, the young woman in red, I actually wish that she would give the sermon. I thought she was doing pretty well. I'd like to hear what she had to say. Um, <clears throat> today I brought my Bible. Uh, I usually don't bring a physical book when I preach. I usually bring my phone. But we had that thunderstorm last night, remember that? The lightning and thunder here in Houston, it felt like it was right on top of my house. Um, and uh, I think we had a power surge in our house and uh, my phone is dead today. Um, and I'm, praising to, I'm praying to the God who raises even the dead <laughs> to bring my phone back to life. Um, my, my sermons are on my phone. I keep all my sermons on my phone. I keep all my references and everything on my phone. And so this morning when I saw that the phone was dead, I, I look up at God and I said, okay, what do you have planned? <laughs> because today we're going to have to go completely off script. Um, in my <clears throat> 11 years of preaching, I have never, ever preached from John 3.16 before. Um, I find that lots of people know this verse, and I feel that lots of people have commented on it far better than I ever could. Uh, but as I was praying over what to share today, my heart felt compelled 
to share from what I have been going through. And as I've been struggling with this cancer on a daily basis, and as the pain has been increasing in my stomach, it's gotten so bad uh, that in the past week, anytime I've eaten anything, I've had to lie down after eating. Um, sometimes in the middle of the meal, I just have to get up and lie down uh, and wait for the pain to go away. Then I come back and eat a little bit more and I go and lie down. Uh, the pain has gotten pretty bad. And I'm sitting there and I'll be in my bed or I'll be, you know, sitting on a chair and, and praying. I'll be asking God to heal and to take away the pain. And more often than not, he doesn't. When the pain is there, it's there, and it stays there until it goes away slowly over time because the food is being digested or whatnot. It doesn't just go away because I pray. Sometimes when I pray, it goes away. But more often than not, I have to sit through the pain. And as I'm thinking about this, I'm praying about this, and I'm processing it, I have to go back over the question of, is not God good? Is not God loving? Then why isn't God answering this prayer right now? Why is it that God is allowing me to suffer in the face of the fact that He is a loving and good God? Does that make sense? Do you understand where that question comes from? And I think a lot of us will face that question at various points of our life. If God is loving, why is it that He allows us suffering? How does that work? Where can we draw from this truth about God or an understanding about ourselves in the, in the tension between the goodness of God, the love of God, and our own suffering. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 3, verse... Let's start with verse 14. And as you do that, I'm going to pray one more time and ask God for His presence. God, there is so much to thank you for. God, there is so much to thank you for. As we stand here, many of my brothers and sisters are still changing their pages to John 3.16. The very fact that we have this book in our presence, God, the fact that we can read your word, angels have longed to look into these truths, God, and you've given it to us, written on this page. And we can just go to a store and buy a Bible, God. In so many countries around the world, that is impossible. And yet you've given us the privilege to be able to go and purchase your word and to know your heart and to know what you have taught us, God, and to see what you have done. Thank you, God, for the gift of your word. Thank you, God, that we can know it and turn to it. And Lord, going further, thank you that you have given us the ability to read. Those of us who are in this room who can open up a Bible, it means we can read. And if we can read, that means we've been more educated than most people in all of history. Hallelujah, praise you, God, that you've given us that gift of being able to read, being able to learn, being able to study. And if we can read, not only does that mean we're literate, it means we have eyes. And God, that you've given us eyes that work and function so that we can read. God, thank you so much for that gift. And God, it means we have light. We're sitting in this room with electricity, with light that we can read, God. Which means you've given us the resources to fund this room and to pay for all this. God, all these things that we have, every single thing that we overlook is a gift from you. What right could we possibly have to complain? What right could we possibly have to point the finger at you and say, God, why do you do this or why do you do that? The only question I could dare ask is, God, why are you so loving in the face of our sins? In the face of our rebellion against you, why do you love so much? And God, in the full awareness of your goodness, of your love, of your gifts, I boldly and audaciously ask for one more, and that would be your presence among us. God, you've told us that when you gather in your name, there shall you also be. We have gathered in your name, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, be present, God. Be here in our midst. Holy Spirit, come. 
Let us feel your fire. Let us feel your presence, God. And I ask that it wouldn't be my words that we share today, but it would be your words speaking through me, God. May you have an indelible encounter with my brothers and sisters here today, such that everyone leaves this room changed eternally. For your grace and for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 3, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And we remember in the Pentateuch, as Moses was leading the Jews through the desert, they had already seen miracle upon miracle. They had seen the seven plagues, or the, the multiple plagues that came upon Egypt, and God saving the Israelites from those plagues. They had seen the Red Sea parted, and they had crossed through it. They had seen God lead the way through a pillar of smoke and of fire. They've seen miracle after miracle, and yet they continue to grumble, and yet they continue to turn against God. Isn't that so much like us, by the way? That we continue to turn, we continue to point the finger at God, even though we've seen miracle after miracle after miracle. We can't look to the Israelites and say, what were you doing when we do the same? as well. But they were grumbling against God, and at a certain point, disease and plague was sent among them. And yet Moses was given the privilege to set up a snake and to say to them, if you believe you will be healed, come and stare into the eyes of this snake that has been lifted up, and God will take away from you your illness, your disease. And we ask, why? What is that about? What is that symbolism about? It was a foreshadowing of exactly what was going to happen with Jesus Christ. Here we see in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this was a serpent that would bring life, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. A foreshadowing of what would happen in Christ. Now we go to verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, the word so here, I've, I've seen a lot of people interpret the word so as for God so loved the world, like He loved Him so much. God so loved the world. That's not what the word so means. The word so in this verse means in this way. God loved the world in this way that He gave His only Son. So whatever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. I want us to see two things in this verse. The word loved first. For God so loved the world. Here is the first element of what I want to talk about today. The love of God. And the reality of the love of God. And His provision and His goodness and His kindness. And His love for us like a father, as the Old Testament says it. And what that means for us today. But also, I want us to look at another element, that He gave His only Son. Now, built into this element of this verse of giving His Son is the notion of suffering. Because when God gave His Son, He gave His Son to die on the cross, which is a brutal, horrible, painful way to die. So in this verse are the two very elements that I want to talk about. The love of God in the face of suffering within this world. And so this is, I think, the perfect place to start. Now, of course, we've all heard this verse. Uh, if you've heard anything about the Christian message, if you've heard the, the word preached to you, you've probably heard this verse before. In a nutshell, it's proclaiming the gospel that God has saved us. Out of His love for us, God saved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is what Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says. If you haven't ever heard these things before, if you're brand new to the Christian faith and you're hearing this for the first time, here's what I mean. That we have incurred for ourselves death by rebelling against the one who gives us life, by rebelling against God. God is the source of life. He is the one who gave us life. Let me ask you, when you were a baby... Did you give yourself life? Did you choose to start living? Before you ever had any choice, before you had any consciousness, God said, I want to give this person life. He is the source of our life. 
And when we turn against Him, when we do things He does not want us to do, when we introduce sin into our lives, that's what sin is, we are pushing away the source of life. We are saying to the source of life, we don't want you, we want what we want. I would rather do what I want to do, not what you want to do. That's what sin is. And if you push away the source of life, if you're pushing away life, what are you getting for yourself? If you push away life, you're getting for yourself death. That is what happens when we sin against God. We're pushing life away. We're incurring death for ourselves. It's not like God says to you, I'm going to strike you down because you sinned. No, you struck yourself down when you sinned. And God steps in and says, I will rescue. I will save you. And that's what this verse is saying. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. It was through His Son's death. Jesus on the cross says, I will die on your behalf. I will take the punishment on your behalf so that you can live. I will take the consequences of your sin so that you can live. That's what Jesus does for us. That's the Gospel message. God loves us that much. That even when we rebel against Him, He says, I will make a way for you. In fact, I will take the suffering upon Myself. That's the greatness of the love of God, and that's what's captured in this verse. He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now I realize a little bit of what I'm going to cover today overlaps with what I shared a few months ago, but that's okay. Repetition's good for the soul. God is not just the source of life. I mean, it's absolutely amazing that He is the source of life, and you take a look at the world around you, and you take a look at all the plants, and you take a look at all the, uh, all the beautiful things you've ever seen, and you realize God is the source of all this. Anything that's ever brought you joy, anything that's ever brought you sustenance, God is the source of all this life, and all this beauty, and all this joy. But He's also the source of all love. We believe in the Christian faith that God is one being, can I hear everyone say one being? One being. But that one being subsists in three persons. Can I hear everyone say three persons? Three persons. That is what the Trinity is. One being that subsists in three persons. In the way that I am one being and one person, I'm a human being who is Nabil Qureshi. God is one being, God, Yahweh, but He's three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Are you with me so far? Now the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and both of them love the Holy Spirit. So the three persons of the Trinity have always loved one another. Are you with me? And so before the world was ever created, before the Son ever rose on the surface of the earth, God existed in a triune relationship. Love existed before the world existed. Are you with me? So love is older than the universe. In fact, love has existed as long as God has existed. Love is eternal. Now this, by the way, is a beautiful teaching which I hope someday to be able to break down a little bit further. The fact that love is eternal and it's because of the Trinity that love exists. No other worldview can explain the eternality of love the way the Trinity can. But God is in His very essence love. It's not just something that He does. It's not just something that He expresses. It is something that He is. He is love. And out of that love, God wrote the universe. It was out of that expression of that eternal love that He has that He wrote this universe and created this universe. That is why if you ever pour love into something, you will see it flourish. Do you have a hobby? Whatever it is, do you, do you cut out you know, stamps or do you play video games or do you do sports or, or, or do you write letters? Whatever your hobby is, if you pour your love into it, you will see it flourish. You will see it grow. The reason why is because God wrote this universe out of love. 
if you have a relationship with your parents or with your spouse or with your siblings or with your children, the more love you pour into that relationship, the more you will see it flourish. Because this universe was created through the principle of love. The very being, our God, Yahweh, who is love. And by the way, this is why 1 John chapter 4 says God is love. This is what it means. So when we take a look at love, we take a look at who God is, we are forced to conclude, especially within the Christian worldview, that God is love, that God loves us, despite the evidence that we might see around us, despite the suffering that we might see, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But God is in His very essence love. There's nothing we can do to make God unloving. Now this is where it gets a little bit more personal. There's nothing we can do that can make God turn toward us and say, I do not love you. We cannot because He is love in His very essence. And this is why the Scriptures say, I believe it's in the book of Ephesians. I don't have my notes. My phone's dead. Sorry. But I believe it's in the book of Ephesians that the love of Jesus Christ is wide and high and long and deep and there's nothing that we can do to separate us from that love. Because He is love love. Now, the scriptures tell us that God is like our Father. That God is our Father. And as a father shows compassion toward his children, this is Psalm 103, as a father shows compassion toward his children, so the Lord shows compassion toward those who fear him. Now, what does that look like? And some people will say, well, God allows you to go through these consequences. God allows you, he, he, he sometimes brings you into difficult times. Well, I know as a parent, you, my, my baby daughter, Aya, is not quite two years old. And she has come to this new habit of saying no. Um, and she's my little angel. I don't understand where she learned that word from. It must have been from her mother. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm going to sleep on the couch tonight. Um, but she's learned to start saying the word no, and she started rebelling, whereas before, for the first you know, two years of her life, she was an absolute angel. She didn't, but now she's beginning to rebel. And so what Michelle and I do when she does that is we put her in time out. We just place her in a little crib, which is in our closet, and we put her there, and we let her cry, and a minute later we come back and we pray with her, and we say, God, Jesus, help us. A lot, uh, help us obey our parents. Amen. And then she'll say amen, and she'll come out, and she can play with us, and, and, and that's what we've done. Now, in that one minute that we've put her in the crib, she's crying her head off, and she's hurting. But what we're doing for her is out of love. Because if we let her grow wild, and if we let her just start rebelling against things, then she will not flourish. And so sometimes love can take the appearance of something harsh. And in that moment, you might have to cry through it. But I tell you what, Michelle's heart and my heart is hurting far more than hers is when we hear her cry in that closet. Sometimes in shaping our children out of love, we have to allow them to go through some difficult times. And sometimes it just doesn't make sense. I know for me, as I was going through medical school, I used to see this quite a bit uh, in the pediatrics rotation. When we had little babies come in, we'd regularly have to give them vaccinations and booster shots, etc. And so the doctors would come, or I would come, and there's the baby, and he's looking at a needle, or she's looking at a needle, and she looks up at her parents like, what is going on? Why are you allowing this to happen? And it's the parent's job to keep the baby away from harm. It's the parent's job to keep the baby away from pain, and the baby kind of knows that, and they see the needle coming, and they're looking to their parents for rescue, little do they know that through the needle comes preservation of life, preservation from illness, preservation from sickness. And the parents are actually bringing life to their child through this momentary affliction. And in the same way, God at times allows us to go through a slight and momentary affliction, as the Scripture puts it, so that we can have eternal life so that we can know real life. So in the love of God, the love that comes like a parent, the fatherly love, we have to remember that that doesn't exclude 
any pain. We might go through pain in the midst of that. But that doesn't mean that the pain doesn't hurt our Father's heart. That doesn't mean that our Father, He doesn't like the pain. He doesn't want us to go through that pain, but we kind of have to because of what exists in this world, because of what we've brought into this world through our own sin. Last night, uh, moving on to, to something else now. Well, let me first just tell you what I'm about to say. Throughout the Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, God comes into the world repeatedly. This is something that really moves my heart because when I was a Muslim, I was taught that God would never come into this world. And then as I look in the Scriptures, I see God coming over and over and over again. We see it at the very beginning. Adam and Eve are in the garden, and who walks with them in the garden? God. God walks with them in the garden. It's as if the three of them are living together in the garden. And then when they sin, that's when we start seeing God remove Himself. But yet, He still comes. Such that God has a conversation with Abraham in Genesis 18. God wrestles with Jacob. God talks with Isaac. God dines with the elders of Israel. God constantly comes into the picture over and over. And He saves the day quite often when He comes into the picture. Now, yesterday, something happened at night um, while we were sleeping. Again, it was in the middle of this thunderstorm. Um, the first thing that happened was uh, Michelle uh, keeps the door to our bedroom slightly ajar um, at nighttime because if we have to leave the room, we don't want the, the door to, to creak open and, and wake the other person up. And so she leaves it slightly open. Well, yesterday, in the middle of the night, the door slammed shut. Okay, so imagine you're sleeping, your wife's sleeping, um, there's this massive thunderstorm going on, and all of a sudden the door slams shut. Now, all those movies that you've seen come to your mind, right? Immediately, like, who's in the house? And so that's the first thought that came to my mind, is who's in the house? Um, but my stomach was really hurting. Um, I didn't want to get out of bed to see if anything was wrong. I just figured, okay, the AC probably came on and that changed the pressure and the door shut, whatever, no big deal. Then I look at my phone, and my phone is dead. Okay, so now the detective movies are going in my mind, like someone is making sure I can't call the police. So that, that's, that's beginning to go through my head. The door just slammed. There's lightning everywhere. And I thought, you know, no big deal. Whatever's going on, no big deal. As long as I don't hear Aya cry. As long as my daughter doesn't start crying. If there's a, if there's a thief in the house, he can take whatever he wants. That's fine. I don't care. But as long as Aya doesn't cry, it's fine. And then, maybe about five seconds later, the monitor in Aya's room went off. And I flew out of bed. Like, I, I literally ran out of the bed and ran up the stairs. Michelle was really worried, like, what's going on? She's trailing behind me. Um, and, and I run up the stairs, and I go to check on Aya, and Aya is sleeping in the bedroom. And then my heart starts calming down. And for those few seconds, the pain in my stomach went away. <laughs> I mean, the adrenaline just took the pain away. And then the, the pain started slowly coming back. And I went back to the room and laid down. And I figured out what happened was that the, actually the whole power went off in our house. And when the power goes off, the monitor makes a noise. And so that's what happened. In my mind, I'm thinking someone's come to kidnap Aya, right? Someone's come to take my daughter. Here's the point I'm trying to make. It never crossed my mind when my daughter was potentially in danger, it never crossed my mind to stay in my bed. It doesn't even cross your mind. You go to your child. The moment you think your child's in danger, the moment you think your child needs you, you go straight to your child. It doesn't matter if there's a criminal in the house with a gun. In fact, that's all the more reason to go. If there's a thief or if there's a murderer in your house to get to your child. That's what our God does. That is exactly what our God does. The enemy has come to steal and kill and destroy. That's what the Scripture tells us in John chapter 10. The enemy is constantly coming after us. He's trying to kill us. He's trying to destroy us. So it never crosses God's mind to stay on His throne. Instead, he rolls up his sleeves and dives right in to save his children. Literally to save his children. Because he loves us. Because he cares for us. 
That is the love of our Father. That is the love of God. That is the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in the midst of this, in the midst of all this, God is constantly providing for us, and we can forget it. We can let it escape our mind. You know, when, when my stomach starts hurting, one of the first things I try to do, if I'm in a good way mentally, uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's something that I've noticed, is physical pain can really mess with you spiritually. <laughs> like when you're physically feeling pain, is all of a sudden when you don't want to pray, all of a sudden when you, when you feel like uh, that something's going to go wrong, or you know, the time the enemy can come against you is when you're physically incapacitated. And that's why it's all the more important in those moments to pray. And to make sure that you have people around you who encourage you to pray. Michelle will encourage me to pray constantly when she sees that I'm in pain. She says, have you prayed? Have you, have you spent time with God? And so, as, as I'm thinking about all this pain, one of the things I try to do is to stop and say, number one, God, thank you so much on behalf of all the people who have no idea what a privilege it is to be able to eat without hurting, I just want to thank you for them. God, I, I just want to thank you on their behalf. Add it to their account, these thanks, that they are able to eat without hurting. And that helps me from becoming envious as well, because sometimes I'll just see people eating food, and I'm like, what? I wish I could do that. <laughs> and just to help me from becoming envious, I say, thank you, God, for the gift that you have given them. And I had that gift for 33 years of my life. And I never thank you for it. Thank you, God, for that gift. And then I start just thinking about all the other things that I have that other people might not have. For example, I know so many people who have multiple sclerosis. And they can't necessarily control all the parts of their body like they want, or they're constantly feeling random pains. Thank you, God, that I don't have that. Thank you for the years that they didn't have that. I have a friend whose brother just had to have his leg amputated. And he didn't even know it. He was, he was for whatever reason, he, he, he was already unconscious when they had to make a decision, his family did, to save his life. In order, in order to save his life, they had to remove his leg. Now, can you imagine going to sleep and waking up with no leg? So thank you, God, for the fact that I have two, and thank you, God, for all the times in his life that he had two. And Lord, may we be so bold as to ask that you would cause that one to grow back. <laughs> so we just start thanking God for all the gifts that you have in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain. Start thanking Him for what you do have. Because you have so much more than you don't have. Five, five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot, being able to walk, being able to talk. Do you know how hard it is to talk? You know what, what's going on here? How many cranial nerves have to fire in just the right way? How many parts of your brain have to be working just perfectly? Wernicke's area and Broca's area in your brain have to be working just perfectly. There can't be any bleeds in those areas. You have these muscles that have to work just perfectly in order to be able to speak. What a gift! And we take it for granted. Oh, and here's a crazy thought. As we praise God for this gift, we're using the gift He gave us to praise Him for it. What can we even give Him thanks for that He didn't first give to us? The very breath that we have in our lungs to thank Him was given to us by Him. And so as we think of all of the love of God and His provision for us and who He is in His essence and the fact that He rushes to our aid, we will begin to understand the love of God that is there for us. And then when we start seeing the suffering in the world around us, we start seeing the suffering in our own lives, it is then that we need to remember this verse, that He gave His only Son. Now let me tell you, I'm going through some pain. I don't want to make it sound like I'm going through a tremendous amount of pain. I've seen people go through a tremendous amount of pain. I've seen people's bodies been crushed in vehicular accidents. I've seen people been riddled with bullets. I've seen people's aortas dissected and split in blood throughout their whole cavities. I've seen true pain. Let's keep things in perspective. And though it's a tragedy what's going on with me in my life, we don't have to look very far to see worse tragedies. In the month of Ramadan alone, how many people have been killed throughout the world? 
On the 27th night of Ramadan, it's usually known as Laylatul Qadr. Some nights during the last 10 days of Ramadan is known as the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. And when I was a Muslim, I was taught to, during that day to pray and pray and pray and to thank God and praise God. I was taught to approach it in a very positive spiritual way. But for reasons that we can't discuss today, it's going to go way too off topic. The day of the year in which the most bombings occur in the Islamic world is that day. And we saw in Pakistan multiple bombs and terrorist attacks happen yesterday at the same time. And can you imagine your whole family being taken from you in the blink of an eye? That's what people are going through around the world right now. Christians in, uh, in, in Egypt, a whole bus. I'm thinking of the one that just a few days ago, terrorists came, and as they got people off the bus, they said, are you Christian? And if they said yes, they said, you have the chance to renounce Christ right now. And if they said no, they would kill him and say next. This just, this just happened this week. You know, here I am. You know, I've been given a diagnosis last August. And I was told that I would have about nine months to live. Praise God, it's been more than nine months. And the only thing that's died has been my hairdo. But let's say the worst should happen. And let's say God should take me through this disease. I had all these months to prepare for it. I had all this time to spend with my wife and my daughter, more memories to make, loose ends to tie up, tell my parents I love them, write more works, write more things to tell the world. This didn't have to happen. God could have taken my life just like that. The end could have come just like that. It happens for people all around the world. So who am I to say that this is a tragedy of the worst order? It's not. There's much worse that's going on in the world today. But no matter what is going on, I cannot think of something worse than being crucified. And of all the reasons to be crucified, I cannot think of anything worse than to be crucified because I love the people who are crucifying me. To save the very people who are crucifying me. That is the worst. And I think about what Jesus went through for us on the cross. When I start feeling self-pity and I start thinking what is happening to me, I just turn my eyes to Jesus. I say, Jesus, what you did for me on the cross far outweighs anything I'm going through right now. There is nothing I am going through that compares to what you went through for me. I will not forsake His name. In the face of any pain, in the face of any suffering, I will not forsake His name. And here's the thing, finally, to close with. If death should come, and by the way, I'm believing for a miracle. I believe in, in the words of Jesus. You know, a lot of people say to me, Nabil, you're not interpreting scriptures correctly, but I read Matthew 8, 17, and it says, He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. And I just think, I think it means He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. <laughs> they say the enemy has come to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus came to bring us life and life to the full. I say this is what He came here for. Well, that's another talk for another day. Should the worst happen? Should life happen? And, guess what? It's actually only beginning. Because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, it is just the beginning of our real life. Though we're, we're seeing life as if through a veil right now. You know, we see beauty, we see colors, we see sunsets, we taste tastes, we hear music, we see art, we think this is all so beautiful. This is nothing compared to what waits for us on the other side of this life. And we have assurance that we will be there because of the work of Jesus Christ. So how can we ask the question, God, why is there suffering if you're a loving God? The only way we can ask that question is if we're so 
hopelessly myopic and short-sighted on our own pains. Instead of seeing who God is, what He has done for us, and what He has procured for us in the afterlife. If we stop being so hopelessly self-centered and micro-focused on the pain that we experience in this life, we will begin to see the greatness of God and the eternal picture in which He has procured for us life and life evermore. In the face of an eternal life of bliss with our Creator, no amount of suffering or pain on this earth can shake our confidence in Him. Praise you, God. Let's pray. God, I think of the many gifts that you've given us. And words fail us, Lord. We cannot even begin to thank you adequately for what you've done, for who you are. And Lord, I don't understand. I honestly don't understand why when I pray that you would take away this pain, that you still let it happen. I don't understand, God. But I'm not going to let the fact that I don't understand interfere with my love for you and my trust in you, my faith in you, God. I know, God, that you are a God who saves. I know, God, that you are a God who heals. And so I await my healing in Jesus' name. And in the meantime, God, I'm going to use every moment to praise you as best I can, Lord. And if I, if I get distracted or if I fail in that, please forgive me and help me come back to the place where I need to be which is a place of love and of trust and of waiting upon the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. God, help us wait for you. My brothers and sisters who are in this room waiting for you, God, please come to their aid. Rush, come in haste, God. Wait no longer. Come to the aid of those who are calling out to you and asking for your salvation. Who are asking for you to rescue but we know that your ways are greater than our ways. And for whatever reason, Lord, if you should delay, if you should tarry, may it be that we have the confidence and the strength to endure to the end when we will receive the crown. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen. What a strong declaration of faith and confidence in the Lord. You know, that's the great, greatest blessing that we can receive from the Lord. It's not more than the healing. Uh, I would request the children of God to stay back. I would um, request you to join in prayer as we together are going to pray for this dear servant of God. So this declaration of faith make us feel together pray for this great man of God. Let's, you know, let's trust the Lord. Let's trust the Lord. This church have been praying for his visit um, this morning. We all have been asking the Lord, Lord, do a miracle here this morning. More than sending the servant to our midst or blessing us or give him something or more than we pray for him, what we need is your touch in his body. And we pray to the Lord, Lord, please use this small congregation as we pray together. May the power of God descend to this place now. The power that is needed for his complete healing. Because our God's healings are not partial. When he does something that is perfect, so there is no place to doubt. You know, I always encourage my, you know, uh, people here, everyone I encourage, we have no right to doubt God. We have no right to suspect Him whether He will do it or not. Because He has the authority to create things out of nothing. If This morning while we were praying, I said, if God can create 
things out of chaos, out of nothing. Nabil is here as, he, as his creation. When he is standing here, why can't God touch him and heal him? He can create. He can touch his internal organs. He can take away the cancer. He can take away the pain that the servant of God is going through. So this morning, you know, I want the whole church to join me in praying for him. May I request you to stand wherever you are. And the servants of God who wish to join here, please come forward, Pastor Sam or other children of God. Anyone, you know, uh, if a few of you feel that authority, that anointing from the Lord to touch him and pray for him, we will do the prayer together because we are children of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We trust not in our perfection. We trust not in our righteousness. We trust not in our holiness. But we trust in the power of our Savior Jesus Christ. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's together pronounce that healing. Pronounce that blessing for this dear man of God. And pray together. Hallelujah. Shout the rabbi. Our dear Father, in Jesus' name, we come to your presence to thank you, first of all, for all your blessings in your servant's life. We thank you for your strength, your power, your confidence in him. Your word says, though the mountains will be shaken, or the hills be removed. Yes. Your unfailing love for us shall never be shaken again. That is forever. That is forever. That is forever. Your covenant of peace will never be removed, O oh Lord Jesus. And we trust in your power. We trust in that unfailing love, O oh Master. Father, your servant in Psalms prayed. When he prayed, he declared, I will not die. I will live to declare the wonderful works of the Lord. Father, please allow us to declare the same promise this morning. This brother, Nabil, will not die, but he will live to declare the mighty names of God. of doctors, the loving doctors may fail. But your power, your love, your mercy, and your compassion that never fail again. Father, we are your children. We have the right and authority to come to your presence and ask what we need. As your servant preached here, you are so loving. You are so compassionate. When your children cry out, you never refuse them. You never reject them, O oh Lord Jesus. With that confidence, I can be together. Come with this servant of God, this man, and to thy hand, O oh Lord Jesus. Father, it's our desire. Even before he leave this place, let him experience the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit in him. Hallelujah. Jesus, we pray. Jesus, we pray. Jesus, we pray. Jesus, we pray. Trusting in the authority and power of the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Trusting in the power of the blood that is shed on the cross for our life. We declare that healing, O Lord Jesus. Because you told us and you promised us whenever you pray, Believe that you have received it. Then it shall be yours. Father, we take that words for him. We take that promise for him. And we claim that healing for your servant and master. And we believe that you have given him that healing. And we declare it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your strength. Father, I also want to commit his family, Sister Michelle and the baby. Bless them. Strengthen them deep in their heart. So that they live with that confidence with their trust and hope in you, O Lord Jesus. Please come back to this place that we can together glorify God's name. May God bless us all. 
Thank you again. Blessings.